any further ado, I'm going to uh, bring a very special person up on stage. Professor Bob Langer is, uh, I think, known to all of you. He is um, very much part of the innovation ecosystem here at MIT. He's a very special part of it. He has founded more than 30 startups. I think there's a slide here documenting that. W one thing I wanted to say about Bob uh, that impresses me perhaps the most is when, when they awarded him the Queen Elizabeth Prize, they said he is the living scientist that has the potential to save the most people on this planet. And I think that is a legacy that doesn't speak just to him as a scientist, really it speaks to him as a human being. And we have, we owe much to his greatness. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Great. Well, thank, thank you so much. Actually, I should give uh, Trond a lot of credit because he revised my talk many times and <laughs> told me what to say. In fact, the first slide he uh, told me what to say. I'm supposed to say something about my background. And so we made this slide and maybe I don't know how well it can be read. I'm actually not going to go over it very much other than to say when you look at it, it sounds like I've done okay. But I actually didn't, didn't want to say that so much. What I wanted to say is to tell you what ha how it started, which wasn't so good. You know, and I got, when I started my career, I was a postdoc first at Boston Children's Hospital, and I had some ideas that I was working on on cancer and on drug delivery systems. And they were very, contra I, I mean, I published them in good places, but they were very controversial. So I got my first nine research grants turned down. I mean, and not just turned down, I mean, they said they were awful. <laughs> I also, um, I also, you know, was a chemical engineer, and, but as I said, I was working in a surgery, a, a medical school, so I applied to chemical engineering departments as a faculty member. Not one chemical engineering department in the United States or world actually offered me a job. They said, well, this stuff doesn't, you know, it's not part of chemical engineering. Of course, it, it, today I always take great delight in the fact that now half the chemical engineering departments in the country have bio in their name. But then they thought it was an anathema. And so what I ended up doing is I ended up joining, I was fortunate enough to join the nutrition department here since no chemistry department would hire me. The only problem there is the year after I came, for those of you that were old enough to remember, there was a department head, Nevin Scrimshaw, who was a great person. And Nevin was the one that hired me, but he was kind of like what I'd call a benevolent dictator. So he hired me, but he didn't really care what anybody else in the department thought. So what happened is, is the um, year after he hired me, he actually left. So several of the associate department has decided to give me advice, and their advice was I should start looking for another job. <laughs> so again, I, I, fortunately, things eventually turned around because of our papers and because of our patents, and so I, th th those kinds of things on that slide happened, and, and including what Tron did mention. Well, another thing that I got excited about doing, I, I, I've always felt like I didn't want to just do the work. I mean, we've published a lot of papers, uh, and I believe in that, and... Uh, but I also wanted to see the work that we did get out and affect the world and really affect people's lives. And so uh, that gave me the idea of patenting things and starting companies. And that actually wasn't looked upon very favorably either in the 1970s or 80s. And in fact, people were often, you know, if you get involved in companies, I mean, today it still could be an issue, but then, you know, uh, people could be jealous or they said this is not the right thing for an academic to do. I felt it was important because I felt if we were going to get products out to the world, you just can't do it in an academic unit. That can get you started. So we started companies, and I'll list some at the end. But I thought, uh, again, based on what uh, Trond uh, asked me to do, is I'll just give you three quick examples. Nanospheres, which has led to two companies, Bind and Selecta, controlled release microchip. Uh, and now a very new thing we've just started about what I'll call super long acting oral delivery system. So I'm just gonna go through all these very fast uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the things we're doing. So nanospheres, I'm gonna actually, the easiest way to do this is Nova, a TV show. They came and did a video on what we do. So I'm gonna just use theirs. It's, it's, they did a great job. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. You can see I, I can't compete with that, right? So it's much, much better to show you that. 
I, I also should tell you that a lot of the clinicians and oncologists I work with have told me it doesn't really blow the cell up quite that way. <laughs> But you get the idea. And, and, and actually now this is in various human trials. Uh, th these are some actually cancer patients. You see uh, this is from Vine's work. Uh, you see it's published. Uh, you see CAT scans before and then 42 days later before and then 42 days later. It's in various clinical trials. Again, they're working with various uh, partners like Pfizer and AstraZeneca and uh, Hupp and LaRoche and Merck and so forth. And then Bind is using related technology uh, for, for different types of vaccines and other companies too. So this has been one uh, exciting area. Another idea, and I thought I'd put this in in particular with the digital thing, is, is uh, microchips. I once had this idea watching this TV show that you know rather than make a microchip that does like with computers or cars, why couldn't we do something with chemicals or drugs? And I talked to Michael Simo, one of my colleagues at MIT, and we had this graduate student, John Santini. He actually started here as a junior for a summer job. And we made these microchips. But these microchips are a bit different. Um, these microchips you can put wells in, and you can fill them with drugs. You can do this all with new kinds of automation and stuff like this. And then you can have these covers. And what we can do is we can actually trigger any cover to come off at any point in time and have the drug come out. And I'll show you that in a second. So the idea is you could literally have a pharmacy on a chip if the drugs are potent enough. You could have all the drugs you'd ever want. And we made some of these. This is an early one. Just to show you, this is a United States dime. This is a top one. This is a bottom one. This a, a view, top view, bottom view. This is 34 wells. We now have ones with hundreds, even thousands of wells. Uh, each well, like I said, contain a different drug or the same dose uh, or, or different doses of the drug. This is kind of a short flat chip. But we've made ones that can be injected through like trocars. You can make them any shape or size. You can make them degradable. And the way they work is you have these little caps, uh, and they'll stay like this for years. They protect the drug. But you can come along, and just with remote control, something like this, you can trigger release. And in nanoseconds, the cover just comes right off. When it does, the drug comes right out. And we published in Nature the fact that you could put different amounts of drug in different wells and trigger them at different times. Or if you wanted the pharmacy on a chip idea, you could trigger release of different drugs at different times. And um, we've actually now even taken this into human beings. This might actually sound like space age medicine, but it's actually in patients. Uh, and, and just to give you one example, it's not, uh, I mean, it's in clinical trials um, with the company. And, and one of the examples that we did, uh, this is actually for uh, older women, is that one of the problems some people have is called osteoporosis, and uh, that's bone loss. And so what we did is we put a, a, a large peptide in that normally the woman's supposed to take a shot once a day. But what happens in a lot of cases, and I'm going to go over this more in a, 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 with another example, is people don't do that. If they're supposed to take a shot once a day, they actually 77% of the women who are supposed to do this I mean, this is nationally, don't. I mean, the dropout rate of people taking injections once a day is 77%. So it, if, so it doesn't really work, except for the 23% of the people who do it. So what we did is rather than an injection a day, we put a little chip in that could be done in a small procedure in a doctor's office, and we programmed the chip to release the drug once a day. This is a, and, and, and we did that, and I'll just show you a little bit of the data. Uh, this is human data, and it's actually more reproducible than, uh, than the injections. This is day 60, 68, 76, and 84 uh, they superimpose. Uh, this is actually an example of the chip. Uh, we're making them smaller and smaller, but they're pretty small already. And what you have is with the chip, you have the chip, you have actually uh, microelectronics, you have a computer program, you have a power source, and you even have an antenna that we imprinted right into this chip. That's how you communicate with it. And the, uh, there's a little bit of encapsulation but I'd say it's about 1 20th of what a pacemaker is. Doesn't affect the release at all, as you can see. And this is what's called histology. That tells you whether there's any irritation or inflammation. And the way to look at that is you see if there's dots here, like those would be inflammatory cells, they're zero. So, so this is exciting. And now, actually, the company has a huge relationship with Teva uh, for different drugs. And, and actually, they've also done work with Novartis, Medtronic, and so forth. Uh, again, started by MIT students. La third and last example actually came from Bill Gates, who came to see me. Uh, and, and we have a number of grants with the Gates Foundation. One of the biggest things that the Gates Foundation 
and also the World Health Organization say is this is again goes back to this issue that you could have a drug, but the fact is in the third world people don't take the even though seventy seven percent that I told you before that might be good uh, in the third world. But what happens is poor adherence, and this is all from WHO to treatment of chronic diseases. Uh, like for in general in drugs, it might be 50% in developing countries, it's even lower. The impact of poor adherence grows as the burden of chronic disease grows worldwide. The World Health Organization says increasing the effectiveness of adherence may have a greater impact on the health of a population than any improvement in specific medical treatments, in other words, than any drug. So one of the things, and, and, and I'll give an example or two on this to end, that the Gates Foundation was concerned about is like malaria. And, and, and so many dr situations where there are drugs, like ivermectin, I uh, could even get into the Zika virus, and I'll mention that too. But there are drugs that could, could stop these diseases, but people don't take them. And so one of the questions that they asked, you know, if you think about taking a pill, actually I'll give you a quiz that Denny Osiello, who is chief of medicine at Mass General, uh, asked me once. He said, what do you think is the mean amount of time that somebody takes a statin drug? Are people familiar with statin drugs? Almost everybody no, probably knows them, right? That's for heart disease. You should probably take them the rest of your life, right? What do you think the mean time frame that people in this country take a statin drug for? It's an oral drug. Any ideas? It's three months. Three months. And, and that's typical. So one of the questions that we began to ask is, could we design pills that might last not just a day, but maybe a week, maybe a, a month, maybe for the rest of your life. It all depends on the potency of the drug. But how could you do that? So I've had this incredibly smart guy, Gio Traverso, who actually got his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins with Bert Vogelstein, one of the top molecular biologists in the world. He's got his MD also in gastroenterology. And we came up with this idea that maybe you could do the following. We do a lot with materials. So what if we could make a capsule, and capsules like we take all the time, but in that capsule, we're going to make a polymer that has what I'll call super elasticity or shape memory. And what happens is we put it in the capsule and it has a certain sort of squished up shape. But when, when the capsule dissolves in the stomach, and we can make it dissolve in the stomach, all of a sudden what will happen is it will open up to a shape, which could be a shape like this. And the key aspect of the shape is that it ought to be big enough so that it will not pass through what's called the pylorus. That's the hole separating the stomach from the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. But it should be open enough so that food can pass and you can't block it. Uh, and also, it should be able to release drugs for any length of time. The last one we've already worked out because a lot of the things that Tron mentioned, I mean, we've designed all kinds of systems that can injectably last for years. But could we do the first two? So uh, we've actually made some of these shapes. Here's an example. Uh, we published the first one of these in Nature Materials uh, last year. Uh, here's an example of one of the shapes. Here's an example of another. Um, some people may ask, is it safe? Well, we, with the Gates Foundation, we've done uh, over 200, actually now I should update that, over 300 pigs, and they've all been fine, and they've been treated very well by uh, a lot of medical doctors, uh, and they've seen no ulceration by the endoscopes, uh, no changes in weight gain, stool frequency, or appetite. And, and I'll just give you one example that the Gates Foundation has been very interested in, which is malaria. There's a drug called ivermectin, it actually received the Nobel Prize last year. And that could actually, they've done calculations that if you could uh, stop, uh, if you could deliver ivermectin and keep the blood level over six nanograms per mil for two weeks, you could actually stop malaria. But people, again, don't take it. Uh, normally, uh, if you, or they might take it once, but then when they go to the doctor, but then they don't keep doing it. So normally you get this, but what happens is, that uh, when you put it in this device, and this is now in pigs, you get released for over two weeks. Just giving you an example of what people talk about with the Zika virus, and, and it could also be true with any mosquito-borne disease. Again, compliance is a, is doesn't, patient compliance is really bad. But again, this same drug can kill mosquitoes. So the th key thing is, is if you got people to take their drugs, it's almost like a, you know, the Gates Foundation people have done modeling, and so it's almost exponential. In other words, if you basically can get even a few more people to have a drug like this and the mosquitoes bite them, the mosquitoes are going to die. So the more people you can get to have proof of compliance, you wipe out a disease that's mosquito-borne. 
And that, and so this, again, we haven't published this yet, but we're going to publish it very soon. And then, we, again, we've started a little company on this because there's so many drugs that you'd rather take, if you could take for a week or a month or, or for the rest of your life, it could make a huge clinical impact. So Amy Shulman, who was uh, uh, head of Pfizer's, uh, for first she was head of uh, uh, their chief counsel and then ran a, a $14 billion division, is now CEO of Lindra, the company that's developing this, and three of our students in the lab uh, uh, who are postdocs are, are, are working on it. Uh, and and uh, I think the first deal we'll get probably from a pharmaceutical company will be later this week. Polaris is backing it and other people will too. Uh, just to end, I, one of the other things Tron said, I should list all our companies. So this starts in 1987 which was Enzatech, which is now Alchemies, which created all these microspheres that, that have affected really millions of people. Alchemies has done quite well. They started in Cambridge. You know, they have products for treating schizophrenia, type 2 diabetes. They're all microspheres based on things we did in the lab. I won't list all of them, but again, they're in all kinds of different areas. This is the microchips one. Uh, some of the other ones that, uh, the, actually, Momenta is right near here. Um, Living Proof, actually, that's a, not a medical company. That's one we're doing with Jennifer Aniston to make new hair products. Uh, uh, and they cover all kinds of things, new ways of, of treating patients who are paralyzed with tissue engineering. This was Bind and Selecta. Go on and, um, and we keep going. Moderna is, is a great example of probably the most successful biotech company in terms of raising money, and they'll, uh, they've raised over a billion dollars uh, uh, in the last couple of years, and uh, will be in six clinical trials by the end of this year. It's amazing, because it just started just a few years ago. Uh, actually, Arman uh, Shari will be here later. He's the great example of a student who started uh, a company, uh, Squeeze, which just had announced a $500 million deal with Roche. Extuit's also developing novel cancer treatments. The Linda is what I just mentioned. Siglion is the latest one. We haven't even announced that, but that'll be a new treatment for new treatments for diabetes based on work that Dan Anderson and, our, and ourselves uh, published uh, just in Nature, uh, two joint papers in Nature uh, Medicine and Nature Biotech this January. I'm going to stop there. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. <laughs>